my name is Spencer Giese. I'm a research education specialist at AKUA, and I'm excited as we start another week of our virtual roundtables. Uh, today's topic, residential education and learning community and academic initiatives. I have some outstanding facilitators, panelists, uh, moderators with us today. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. Um, the interest in this virtual roundtable is incredibly high. So thank you to all of you as members for showing us that yes, this is a topic we need to continue supporting and sharing information on. As we get started, I wanted to uh, point out this week's virtual roundtable schedule. Um, this week, our virtual roundtables are brought to you in partnership with both the QOI and Dorm Removers. So thank you to Dorm Removers for your partnership on this week's virtual roundtables. Um, you're obviously in our Wednesday session today. Uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern, we have small colleges and universities as the virtual roundtable. And on Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we have Navigating Move Out. So some really salient topics and great ways to connect with the field. I would be remiss if I did not again share with you all the Akuai online resources that you can check out. We have a number of YouTube recordings. We have a number of threads in our online community that is constantly being updated and having information shared on it by members like you. And we have a, a page dedicated to our COVID-19 resources. Um, I would just give a shout out to all of you for being members. Your membership dollars really help ensure our continued ability to continue to provide resources such as these and to support our professional community as a whole. So we again appreciate your support. Thank you for being members. Um, moderating today's discussion are going to be Esme and Jeff. We'll get to hear from them shortly and we will have three great facilitators on the call with us, Carl, Lisa, and Chester. But before we get started, I just wanted to again remind us how our virtual roundtable today uh, can best function and that's with you as an attendee being a participant and active engaged member of our session. Um, you have the ability to connect with others on the uh, round table and also to have your voice heard and your questions heard. Um, if you've got questions and comments on this topic please use that Q&A tab uh, to submit those questions and comments and when you do so we'd love if you could put your question and your name position institution just so we can better uh, frame the perspective that you have and get to connect with you more. As audience members, you have the ability to see all the questions that are posted. So maybe you're an audience member and you see a question posed and you have an answer or something that can relate to that topic, feel free to write that in in the questions and comments. You also have the ability to upvote questions. So as you see a question that that's very salient to you and you wanna touch on that more, you can upvote that to make sure that our panel does speak on that uh, topic today. Um, and we may, we may use the chat function to say, hey, would you like to read that question on, on the air and directly connect with us? So be mindful of that if you see messages. Another way to connect is the raised hand function. Right now we're gonna use the raised hand function to make sure that you are seeing a PowerPoint deck, you are seeing some lovely faces on webcam. If you're seeing both those things, if you could just hit the raised hand function, let me know that our, our tech side is working well. Awesome, lots of hands raised, wonderful. I'm gonna lower those now, but thank you again for being engaged in that fashion. Uh, what I will tell you, if as we go through today, if we see that your hand is raised, that's a good indicator to us that maybe you wanna to touch on that topic a bit more. So be mindful, try not to accidentally hit that raised hand function because you make it cold on. Um, just like class, but way more fun. Um, so those are my IT tips. Make sure that we're connected and then your messages from a cool why. Um, I wanna certainly pass it over uh, to those leading our discussion today. So Esme and Jeff, I pass it over to you. Thanks for being a part of this. Awesome. Hi everyone, my name is Esme Cabra. I am the Assistant Director for Living Learning Communities here at East Carolina University. And I also have the pleasure of serving as the chair of this year's Academic Initiatives Conference. Thank you for joining us. And I am gonna have Jeff introduce himself. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Godowski. Um, I currently serve at Cornell University as an assistant dean in our West Campus House System for Florida Rose House. And um, along with Esme, I'm on the Academic Initiatives Conference um, team as the chair elect for our next year's conference. Um, and we'd love to introduce um, folks that are here today with us. Um, so if we can get each um, person to just say a little bit about um, their institution, um, their title, and their role with um, either academic initiatives or um, residential education. 
Um, and then just something that's going on for you right now this week, um, knowing that there's a lot going on for us um, over the last couple months, um, but just, just really want to check in and see where are you at this week. And Carl, if we can start with you. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this panel. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Carl Krieger. I serve as Director of Residential Education for Student Life at Purdue University. Uh, my role oversees and supports uh, well, really just supports uh, all the academic and educational programs that are with our within our division of student life, uh, which includes our learning communities uh, and um, our residential education uh, programs, as well as all of the other uh, educational programs that are happening on campus uh, at any given moment. Um, right now, uh, what is going on is very much uh, a transitional point for us. Uh, we are in the offboarding portion of um, of the the semester. I mean, what we're at the point, uh, and we we actually did a training about it two weeks ago about what offboarding means, and it's really important, especially now, to offboard our uh, our students and our staff and our faculty members who are transitioning into the summer. Um, we are starting to develop uh, and implement some trainings for the summer, uh, and we'll probably talk. About, I'll probably talk about that a little bit later. Um, and those trainings are really to start people in getting into the mindset of planning for the fall during the summer. And so, those are the two big uh, tangible pieces that are happening. Really, what we're also seeing is uh, decisions are starting to get made. And so, we are slowly but surely uh, getting little snippets from some of the task forces that have been implemented uh, that are starting to let us know uh, what is actually going to happen uh, this upcoming fall. Lisa? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Williams, and I serve as the Associate Director for Undergraduate Residence Education, um, and specifically focusing on academic connections and leadership education at the University of Michigan. Um, and so my role uh, provides oversight of our Michigan learning communities, as well as our theme communities, um, and some of our leadership education initiatives, so our Residence Hall Association, um, student leadership positions across the board. For us this week, we've been, um, our closing date was a couple weeks ago. And so actually we are in a weird space where this week and some of my living learning programs colleagues might, under, might feel this as well. We're operating normally. Uh, so our LLP deadline is today, uh, which feels strange when we don't necessarily know what fall will look like at the university, but we are working uh, to admit students, to accept students into our programs. And so that is kind of keeping us busy while also navigating um, a lot of student questions, a lot of staff questions about what will fall look like um, and developing contingency plans and all those pieces. Um, but a, a strange sense of normalcy is we're, we're pulling in students into our programs for next fall. Awesome. So uh, Carl started to mention this a little bit, but we want to touch on the implementation. So what are some current practices you, you all have implemented this semester regarding student learning, residential education, or living learning communities, and how are you assessing them? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a go at that first. Um, I think that there, in terms of what our practices are, um, it has depended upon learning community uh, and what type of learning community they were and the staff and faculty that oversee that. And so you'll, there are some that were more academically focused. Uh, and so the transition of their program was really a transition uh, that was typical for any classroom setting. And so you would see um, their interactions just move to online interactions. Uh, and, then, and, and then the out of classroom pieces were generally either more social oriented, the ones that were planned, or they were ones that, um, that were kind of uh, field studies and things like that that were part of the class experience that would transition into the co-curricular. And uh, clearly most of those had to be canceled. Um, what we did see that were that other um, 
communities. We have one called the Data Mine, which is uh, a community of uh, a community that has an umbrella over uh, it of uh, focusing on data science. And within it, it has uh, 20 learning communities that have a piece of data science that they're focused on um, and take courses together. And so they have a faculty head and they have a, an executive director and those people put on programs and students are required to go to them. Uh, I think there was a moment of hesitation about whether or not those kind of programs were going to continue um, because the students are required to go to a certain number of them. And so how would you manage that for the students who had already attended their requisite number versus those who had not? And the choice was to continue to um, to put on those programs, but just partner uh, with those uh, colleagues and um, and and uh, executives out there in the workforce who are going to do those presentations to just transition them to the uh, online world, uh, the virtual world, as we've seen most uh, things be transitioned. And so that um, that's what we've seen uh, in terms of programmatic development. In terms of assessment, uh, we are slowly but surely getting to the point of assessing some things and we've already assessed others. And so it really just depends on kind of where you are. Uh, for us, uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do was look at connection and what connection looks like in the virtual world and this new paradigm that we're in. And so we began to ask, uh, or we sent out a survey to uh, a sample of students um, and we made sure to ask uh, a distinct group of uh, or distinct sample size of learning community members and non-learning community members. And we asked them about how they were connecting and how much they were connecting with their peers, um, both the peers on their floor if they weren't part of the learning community or peers in their building that weren't part of the learning community, as well as those who were part of the learning community. And then asking them about their connection to faculty that were part of their learning community versus not part of their learning community. Because we wanted to really see um, if uh, there was a difference. And I think many of us, uh, what we're hoping that we see from the data, which will uh, be uh, diving into that data soon. We really hope that we see that there shows that the learning community faculty members did uh, end up doing what we think they would do, which is to connect and to interact and, um, and, and really show the value of, of the learning community experience. Uh, so I think from our perspective, um, the reality really kind of starting in early March until now was for a lot of housing departments, including mine, we were spending probably about four weeks trying to figure out how to get our students out of our spaces. Um, and we're really in crisis management mode. And so what we recognized at Michigan was a lot of our colleagues had a um, had gotten a head start on how to transition virtually because we were really just trying to figure out how do we get these students home or into a safe space. And so um, we were a bit behind on those pieces, but um, divisionally, as we shifted to more virtual engagement, um, it was an expectation that we were assessing our programs um, to see what was working and what wasn't. And so we took a lot of our, um, particularly our academic initiatives to a virtual format with some success, uh, some struggles. Um, we're noticing some things about screen fatigue, which I think we can probably talk about a little bit later too um, with our students. But really um, trying to do some of those faculty engagement opportunities online. Um, all of, a lot of our Michigan learning communities did an outstanding job with some end of year pieces and moving those virtually. So doing um, some of their graduation pieces and being able to recognize their students who have lived with them um, and who've spent a great amount of time and really honoring their commitment to that. Um, and then I think from a recruitment perspective, especially as we think about living learning programs, um, I think our staff did a really good job of pivoting. Um, as many folks also recognize, March and April are really big recruitment months for living learning programs. And so, um, and particularly bringing students to campus. And so um, one of our assistant directors did a great job of pivoting and putting all of those opportunities online to um, pretty good success. Students were, incoming students were wanting to see that. And so making sure that um, 
we are taking advantage of those opportunities and still trying to do the work that we would um, just in a virtual environment. I think some of the assessment pieces, uh, we try our best to kind of do that throughout the academic year in terms of measuring sense of belonging and some pieces um, for both our for both types of living learning programs we have. And so that is something where we're kind of continuing to do those check-ins and moving forward and using that information. Um, but I quite honestly think we kind of paused on some of those assessment pieces because they were gonna go out April 1. Uh, and that was just not, uh, not a great time for um, our staff, but also our students. It was a big disruption in their lives. Um, and so kind of trying to figure out how do we still get the assessment data we need while recognizing that there's been a huge impact in our students' life. So thinking in this uh, similar mindset to assessment, um, how are you and your institution sort of capturing information right now, um, sort of telling the story of your department and really showing um, the value added for your programs? Um, we understand that there's a lot going on in institutions and um, there might be fiscal um, offsets that happen as a result of this. Um, so um, what in any way is your department sort of advocating or, or showing information um, about your program specifically to leadership right now? So um, in terms of assessment itself, uh, I think we did a lot of reflection about uh, what type of assessment we were going to do. Um, I mean, really, it, it's, I think for many of us, as we are uh, going out, going through a normal here, uh, we're asking about learning outcomes and we're trying to gauge learning outcomes. Uh, we want to see uh, the, the data that shows us that a student, there was transfer of knowledge, there was, there was uh, a development of a student. And I think what we have realized or what we did realize was that um, at this point, that might not be what uh, is going to move the needle. And so we transitioned uh, many of our surveys to satisfaction. Um, and really, we started doing some of the things that uh, some of us have pushed back on in the past decade, which is number counting. Uh, and so for us, it, it very much was about, okay, well, we know that a student now, if we're going to survey them, we can't do the, some of the traditional assessments that we do when in person. I mean, there, there's a laundry list of, list of assessments that you can do at the end or during uh, an educational program that you do for students. Um, and yet in this new paradigm, it's more difficult to find that laundry list. And so it becomes more survey oriented. Uh, and so with that, uh, just like we saw screen fatigue, we, f we saw survey fatigue very quickly because they're, they're, they feel like a test or an exam is a survey itself. And then they get another survey at the end of a presentation and another survey from this department. And so uh, for us, we went, we decided that shorter was better and satisfaction was, uh, short satisfaction surveys were going to get us the most bang for our buck. Uh, and so um, that's what we've started to do. Uh, we have started to send out surveys to students um, for programs that are happening in student life. Uh, we, uh, for some departments, they are sending out a survey that for each program and they're saying, what was your satisfaction for this program? For others, they are sending it out to a group of people that had already signed up for prior programs of a similar type, and they knew they probably went to these other programs that have been online, because uh, sometimes it's hard to track who is at your program. Uh, and so they've been getting some of that survey on the uh, results on the back end. Uh, and so I, I think the real hard part of surveying right now is that um, some programs that you that that we are doing are pre-recorded videos and we're putting them up and some of them are live and we're we're broadcasting those uh, some of those are mixed um, and so how do you assess all of those different parts have been really difficult um, but I think that 
what the hope is is that we will then pull all of that information and as i talked about before we were we assessed connection um and interaction and we're hoping that uh what that shows is the value and power of our learning community model uh, and that our fac those faculty members and staff members in particular were ones who reached out in this new paradigm and were ones that made our students feel connected uh, even though they were, uh, were not here on campus. Yeah, I would say similarly, we uh, move to and it kind of aligns with some of the divisional priorities I was speaking about earlier of we really move to doing some divisional assessment as well as just having a pulse on what it, in, virtual engagement looks like from the division of student life so all departments within the division put in what we're doing to kind of engage students virtually we put in how many students attended um, and we put in kind of the assessment data we're gathering to get a bigger picture but also I think, um, especially at a place as large as Michigan, it can be really easy to duplicate efforts. And now is not the time to be duplicating efforts for a variety of reasons. And so trying to kind of navigate that, um, we have spent, as we think about the value of our work, I think we have spent really the past year making sure that we have the assessment data, especially as it relates to our living learning programs to show the strong outcomes that our students are gaining from being in those programs. And so, that has been ongoing work and continuing work. And I think too, I was in a conversation with a colleague yesterday talking about just campus partnerships and the value of the work we do. And I think um, quite honestly, as students left campus, I think a lot of our faculty and academic affairs partners started to see how important the residential component of campuses are because it just felt different. Um, and so I think we're even hearing anecdotally in conversations with some uh, kind of partners in academic affairs that they're starting to really understand the value and importance of the work we do and the vibrance that we bring to a university campus. And so I think that's a unique opportunity for us to kind of continue to share that, but then making sure that how are we engaging those partners moving forward. Thank you. So before you move on to our next question, um, we want to introduce our um, third facilitator, Chester, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, if you want to say your name, institution, um, and your role at the Roy, the Roy, your institution, and also um, what's going on in your campus right now in terms of um, living learning communities and where you're at. Yes. Um, so again, I apologize. Um, for being a little bit tardy. Um, I'm actually uh, supporting the rest of uh, the department as I'm sure many of you all are. Um, we're in the middle of a move out process and I was helping the department walk buildings. Um, so I was trying to, trying to find a landing space to connect to, the, uh, to our Wi-Fi. And unfortunately in our apartment community uh, where I'm currently located, um, that internet access is spotty at, um, at best. Um, so uh, thank you Esme for uh, the introduction. My name is uh, Chester Miller. I serve as the Director of Residential Learning and Academic Initiatives at North Carolina State University. Um, long title, um, but in short, I provide oversight and leadership for our living learning communities here at North Carolina State University. Uh, which is an, an esteemed honor um, and privilege. Um, uh, certainly have a passion for this kind of work. And what we're currently doing now, um, like probably many other campuses, is um, assessing what the path forward is um, as we anticipate what the decision is for what fall may look like for our various institutions. Um, we have uh, some sort of a foundation of what virtual engagement like, might look like for us. Um, we quickly had to pivot, just like many other institutions, um, to how we, he, we might implement and execute a student engagement strategy for our living learning communities and for our uh, residential curriculum. Um, our living learning communities uh, fall under that umbrella and it requires us to work in tandem both with um, our partners within, um, our staff within, um, our university housing department, um, but also with uh, partners across campus. And as you can imagine, um, having to turn and pivot in a very short period of time uh, raises a lot of challenges. Um, uh, many of that 
may have been uh, alluded to uh, listening to Lisa about um, you know the strategies and, and uh, challenges you're trying to avoid um, at, at a large institution and that's the nature of uh, creating so much overlap um, you know recognizing the the need and necessity to engage students but all of our um, student affairs departments and our campus partners are trying to do the same thing and it's to the best of our ability communicating with those units uh, to make sure that they are aware of what we're doing and there's some kind of common repository with how that engagement is actually taking place uh, to prevent duplicating the wheel, but also finding common ground uh, to share resources and um, to, to kind of utilize the expertise across campus in different ways uh, to capitalize on opportunities to engage our students. Also recognizing that our, our students in uh, a virtual environment um, having to kind of change and adjust uh, to what online learning looks like. Um, the last thing you want to do is kind of um, force what student engagement might look like uh, for them, but it's important to kind of take cues from our students on exactly what their needs are and their level of uh, interest in uh, online engagement. So uh, we're, we're kind of looking at what we've done. Uh, we've outlined an amended approach for um, our residential curriculum to kind of support online engagement. And it's kind of uh, having a postmortem with the team to determine what worked well um, and, and where, we're, where are areas within that um, virtual engagement model that will allow us to make the adjustments as we plan for fall uh, to make, a, uh, make for a better uh, implementation and engagement opportunity, not just for the students, but also for the staff that have to um, take the lead on implementing and executing some of those strategies. Um, I'm not sure about many other institutions, but we have both resident advisors and mentors for our living learning communities. And so it, it means coming together as a department and, and talking about what are our priorities, what exactly are the goals of our uh, engagement model, now transitioning uh, to an online model perhaps for the fall as well, um, and, and making sure that we're working together as a team to come up with a comprehensive um, an effective uh, engagement strategy that's beneficial to all that's involved. Thank you, Chester. That was a good transition. So we want to transition into thinking about our residential and learning community staff. So how are you use, utilizing your professional staff, mid um, entry level staff, and also your graduate students, student staff that work with educational programs and living learning communities? Um, I can start. I think for us, especially as we're now kind of in, in summer mode, for lack of a better term, um, we are utilizing our hall director staff um, for a variety of reasons. We um, have a reduced staff right now. And so we are utilizing those individuals to kind of pull into some of these project pieces, which includes some of the work around living learning communities, some of the engagement pieces that Chester was talking about, um, as well as um, finding opportunities to engage our staff who work with our living learning programs in that conversation. And so we are spending a lot of time kind of taking an opportunity to rethink how we do uh, living learning programs at our institution. Um, because the reality is, even if we are back on campus in the fall, um, we're not going to be able to have the large gatherings. We're not going to be able to have like kind of the large community building events that we have had um, in years past. And so how are we working through that and really engaging our entry level staff um, in some ways as a professional development opportunity um, to kind of maybe get some experience in areas that they haven't had experience in prior, but also um, sometimes for those of us who do the work day in and day out, we need some individuals who can provide a different perspective. And so utilizing those individuals for that um, I think for student staff, we also kind of have uh, peer advisors and res staff. Um, most of our students are gone right now. Um, I think we are down to a handful of res staff who are here helping with um, kind of our reduced summer student numbers. But um, I think we are trying to kind of 
occasionally check in on them and engage them in kind of planning for the fall because again they have a better sense of sometimes have a better sense of what our students are wanting and so figuring out ways where as we're trying to figure this out we are touching into folks who maybe we wouldn't have normally in the past um and uh i'll chime in as well um and here at North Carolina State University, I, th I think one of the important things, um, I think for many institutions, as we look at what fall might, may bring for us, is also the realities that there are going to be uh, some impacts and challenges. I, I think when you uh, kind of look at living learning communities, they kind of fit a little bit higher on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you know, the most important thing for all of our institutions is making sure our students are safe, have a, you know, have a proverbial roof over their head and, and make, making sure the basic needs are met. Um, so, you know, my perspective um, on this for our team is, you know, now's the time also to take a step back and, and kind of look at um, what is the impact that we're trying to make, you know, with our living learning communities and, and how do we justify our existence in potentially a climate that is facing budget cuts. Um, you know, and, and that's why for us, it was really important um, to kind of, um, you know, look at the, the opportunity that, that we're given because we didn't have to, um, just like, you know, some other institutions, they made the, the tough decision to not keep student staff employed uh, during this time. And that includes uh, the staff for living learning communities. Um, you know, fortunately, NC State did not fall into um, that arena. We uh, maintain employment of all of our staff and, you know, recognizing that they are students and they have obligations first uh, to kind of completing their academic curriculums. We say do what you can um, as best you can um, to the level that um, our students are sort of expecting and looking for that engagement. Um, keeping in mind that, you know, our students, you know, it's a huge transition and impact to um, the students and um, the uh, student staff uh, transitioning to a learning, you know, a virtual environment when they're used to having so much physical contact. Um, and, and so that's a trauma in and of itself. And so we have to uh, kind of meet the students where they are. So as we kind of look at what fall uh, may, what the impacts to fall our pandemic world may pre present to us, this is an opportunity to kind of reevaluate at all levels. Um, what do we want our student staff to do? Um, what can they do? What is reasonable? And, and then, you know, what, again, what are the goals? What, what should be the bare minimum that we're trying to make sure our students uh, get out of their experience if we're so fortunate to, to have, you know, a, um, a high level of participation in our living learning communities. And I put air quotes around high level because we really don't know what that will look like, right? Um, and, and again, you know, ultimately, um, the university's focus is making sure that the students uh, come in transition and and as much as possible have some degree of normalcy um, in navigating what fall might look like and where we step in is um, again accentuating what normalcy will look like um, through the lens of a living learning community experience um, but I think it's also important to be realistic with what those expectations are and can be uh, for the staff and that's why I think it's important for us to kind of st step back um, recognizing that we will have ultimately limited time to put a plan in place, an effective plan in, in place, um, but to reevaluate how we want the staff to be most successful um, in, in either a full virtual environment or a hybrid um, virtual environment, as uh, Lisa, you know, kind of alluded to. We don't know, you know, based off of uh, social and physical distance guidelines, we may not have um, more than 10 students in, in a, a particular space to be able to, to engage them. And so how, how can we be effective with that? So we have to look at all scenarios and really take the needed time uh, to put together, uh, you know, the best plan, uh, plan possible. Right. And, um, and kind of going off of uh, the staff connection, um, building into your work with campus partners and key stakeholders, 
Um, so particularly, um, have any of those relationships shifted? Um, or how might you be working differently with um, stakeholders such as faculty and their involvement with um, living learning programs or academic initiatives um, or any other um, key offices that you work with frequently? So, um, so one of uh, my roles in the division is to, um, uh, to provide training and education for our staff as well. And I think that this is one of the areas that I've tapped into our partners, uh, maybe more now than ever, um, because I think that, um, that there is an expertise out there that we never tapped into because we didn't have to. And now's the time to tap into that expertise. And, and many of us have uh, distance learning faculty members, or we have a center for innovative learning or something that is along those lines where there is a group of people who understand how to educate students online and they generally support uh, faculty members in, in providing that, uh, that educational paradigm when it's necessary and it, and it has been necessary in the past. We have plenty of classes every year that are online and faculty members reach uh, out to these partners to support that. And I think that this is time for us to do that. And so we have done some of that and we've provided some of that training. Um, and so those partners have helped us. Um, it, as Chester was talking, um, it kind of alluded to really one of our, our uh, sessions that we're going to have tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we, we have a, an executive whose job it is uh, to help companies plan um, in the, for their future and then implement those plans. And that, that, uh, that executive was part of our executive in residence program that we have here at Purdue. And so he was here on campus uh, just a, a, a couple years ago. And so we, we tapped into him again and said, hey, we know this is what you do and we need to plan for the unplannable. Can you come help us and, and teach us what we have to think about with this? And so we've reached out to them. Um, some of the other people that uh, I, I've talked to recently that I don't know that I would have ever thought uh, initially to talk to them about these things, but uh, our architect and uh, design partners, um, they are out there right now thinking about uh, space. That is their job, to think about space. And so if you have architect or design firm partners that you've worked with in the past, uh, now might be a good time to reach out to them. Uh, I know that they are trying to wade through um, all kinds of research about particulates and and space and uh, surfaces and how quickly microbial uh, cleaning needs to happen and all of these things that maybe we don't have time nor the knowledge to 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 understand what it all means but if we reach out to them maybe they can help us understand how we can put 10 people in a room and limit the, their exposure, but still develop community. How does that happen? And so I, I think that that's another partner that, uh, that is good for us to think about right now. Awesome. Chester? Um, uh, you know, it, it, just to follow up with, uh, with Car what Carl said, you know, um, you know, operations is going to be extremely important um, in how we manage our spaces. Um, and, and then, you know, transitioning, um, facilitating and teaching content physically is drastically different than what needs to happen in a virtual environment. And, um, you know, I, I think it's important to engage um, our faculty, um, you know, j just to kind of see what kind of plans are and conversations are taking place there. I also appreciate some of the uh, resources and opportunities to to connect with folks within the profession uh, throughout Akuho I and in, uh, you know, ACPA and NASPA and some other areas, um, just to kind of share best practices and, and uh, to share resources that may be um, in practice or being used at other institutions as we all try to navigate um, 
you know, what our future holds in a pandemic world. Um, I, I think we have to potentially leave no stone unturned um, in this process. Um, you know, uh, keeping in mind, you know, whatever the priorities are uh, that are taking place at your institution, uh, you know, because circumstances are different um, depending on where your institution is located with state, you know, um, and, and also the anticipated uh, second wave for the virus, you know, um, a lot of uh, different considerations need to be um, need to be considered and you need to tap into as many resources that's provided, at, you know, throughout your division uh, to, you know, sort of address and put put forth um, a plan that kind of prioritize what are the imperatives for your institution moving forward. Okay, so we're going to transition into answering some questions from the participants. Uh, so Jessica Robinson from S San Francisco State University wrote on here, um, what are some of the successful online academic initiatives? I think Lisa, you were talking about once um, you went ahead and moved um, towards the closing aspect in March, um, you all had some online initiatives that you all were implementing. What are some of those? So I think there are a couple of different pieces and for uh, different audiences. So I think we found the most success uh, quite honestly, in virtual opportunities for kind of pre-existing cohorts. So our theme communities, our Michigan learning communities, um, because I think those students have really built a sense of community and found it very disruptive. And so a lot of the opportunities that we did with those groups were really successful. Um, we typically, we hold a monthly kind of faculty dinner that we tried to take online. Um, and it was limited success. Um, because I think, again, students were feeling a little bit of the, the screen fatigue, um, but I think we were committed to, to doing anything that we could to kind of establish some sense of normalcy for our students. Um, and then I think the other piece that I mentioned were more so directed to incoming students. So again, with um, so much of the recruitment period uh, and on-site recruitment period gone for living learning programs, we took a lot of what we would do at campus visit days, at info fairs online into a webinar format. Um, and our assistant director did a phenomenal job of kind of turning that around pretty quickly um, and having, um, I think overall, we did three and we had close to 200 to 300 students attend those. So um, I think kind of just the pivot piece, um, but I think overarchingly, um, and one of the pieces we're struggling with with for fall is we had a lot of success in that cohort. And so how do we create that cohort model for students who aren't in our living learning program, um, especially if we aren't on campus in the fall, if we are all remote, what does that look like? Um, and I think the piece too, with a lot of the academic, academic initiatives is what do the students want? Um, I think we tend to recycle the same programs year after year after year. Um, and I think it's time for us probably to check in with students, especially as we're moving to this virtual piece and say, what are you looking for in terms of engagement um, once you're outside of the classroom? And um, just to uh, piggyback off that uh, just a little bit is, um, I think that that, uh, that idea of asking students is often not not realized nor done, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, but we kind of go into a year and say our students wanted this last year, so they want it this year. And I think this upcoming year is going to be more, it's going to be more important than ever to ask our students. Um, we are currently uh, in uh, kind of the development of a possible uh, survey to send out to students to ask them what do they expect coming back onto campus. Um, and um, just as a a piece of advice there, just as all of us got uh, all of these emails when everything first got shut down, we, got, we were getting emails from companies we didn't know we ever engaged with, and yet they sent us an email saying what they were going to do about COVID. Um, there are plenty of those same companies that are sending out surveys uh, asking, what, what do you expect from this company? Steal that. 
take it from them. We, um, I, I totally ripped off our local um, workout facility that had sent out a survey to their student or to their, uh, to, to the people that used that, that workout facility. And my friend told me he got it. I said, send it over. And they asked great questions about how far did people expect for workout uh, machines to be and things like that. There are so many companies that are asking great questions. Rip that off and figure out what they were trying to ask and then use it to, to ask similar questions. Uh, we need to be asking our students what they want uh, and then we need to try our best to, to give them that with this concept that we are still trying to be educators. And with that in mind, I think now is more important, the fall is more important than ever to uh, make sure we have outcomes first before we develop the programs um, because it's going to be very easy for us to use a scattershot approach and just try everything. And if we're trying everything, then we're not, at, we may hit our end goal, but we may not. And so make sure that you've talked with uh, the powers that be and ask them what they're hoping from this semester too. Uh, if they're hoping for numbers this semester, you might want to just give them numbers this semester. Um, and if they're still okay with learning outcomes, then yes, by all means, continue to give that to them. But I think now is more important than ever to ask up front what people expect and not go into another year just kind of doing what we did before. So um, I think we might have time for a little bit of one more question before Spencer transitions us out. Um, so there's a, a couple questions um, from the chat about any possibility of online living learning programs in the fall. Um, and if you've started to plan for those so far um, and what that planning process is like for virtual engagement. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, start. Uh, for North Carolina State, um, you know, we haven't necessarily been able to communicate anything more than we do anticipate students being involved in our living learning communities. We've continued to recruit and to approve students' participation in our living learning communities for the fall. Um, I guess once we have a very clear, succinct idea of a, a, a scenario that we can base forward planning and forward movement on. Um, that's the phase where we all need to come together as a department to talk about what does that look like, not just from a living learning community perspective, but from a department uh, perspective. Me personally, one of the things that I'm uh, slightly concerned about is our students who are not participating in living learning communities. What is, um, you know, what might be the opportunities for uh, community engagement and connection? Uh, we already know that there are going to be strong communities um, as students self uh, select and participate in our living learning communities, there's going to be a strong sense of community there. Um, but I think as a department, we, we collectively need to be looking at how are we serving and meeting the needs of all of the students collectively across uh, the department, um, recognizing um, we do anticipate students being able to live on campus. We don't know, you know, uh, the percentage of occupancy, obviously. Um, but we do anticipate students uh, participating in the living learning communities, but we also have to um, be not so formalized or so structured um, by only creating uh, engagement opportunities for students in our village, but also potentially offering a, a buffet, if you will, of opportunities for them to um, share and, and participate and engage in, um, you know, just across the board um, to meet all of their needs. Um, but yes, we do anticipate um, and plan to have our living learning communities um, in the fall as well. Yeah, I think we are preparing for that. So um, I just really kind of met with um, all of our living learning program partners last week to start talking about um, what online opportunities could look like with the reality more so around um, even thinking about the academic courses that are connected to the communities, what does that look like? Um, knowing that large lecture courses will probably um, have to look differently next year. Um, 
some of our communities have really strong service learning components. And so that has changed. And so I think we're starting to see now that we are kind of finishing the recruitment piece, um, starting to look at, okay, well, what could it really look like? And so working with campus and community partners on what, what an online service learning experience looks like. Um, but then also, I think I echo what Chester said about kind of worrying about our students who aren't in our living learning program um, and the connections they're able to make. And I also worry, depending on what next, next semester looks like, um, access to high speed internet access to computers. I think that's something that our uh, living learning program partners are talking a lot about of if we mm -hmm. take this online, who are we not including? Um, mm -hmm. And so figuring out how do we either help support those individuals and kind of what does that look like? And so um, we are planning kind of a little day long virtual retreat, which is either a great idea or a bad one. We're not quite sure yet. Um, but to kind of start talking through all of our contingency plans for the fall and what that looks like. And uh, to, to Lisa's point, I mean, that, that is a, a critical piece that cannot be understated. Um, you know, when you think about the level of access, we hear it all the time, you know, just in terms of, um, you know, students just clearly not having the access. You know, if, if they are at home um, and not for, you know, um, depending on what the fall scenario looks like, if they're not able to live on campus and actually having to live at home, um, if, if, you know, maybe there's not a, a robust internet connection. Maybe there isn't a computer, um, or if there is a computer, it's a shared um, resource where time is split between parents or siblings or anyone else that also has to do some of the same things. Um, you know, so there, there's just a lot of considerations um, that we we have to be, cons you know, that have to be considered. And, you know, I think uh, Carl talked about this earlier is that, you know, the importance of the need of assessing our students, uh, what are their expectations? Because, you know, when you, uh, the language that we post on our website and, you know, um, uh, speaking from uh, uh, NC State's living learning community uh, perspective, um, a lot of our living learning communities have had a robust offering of experiential learning opportunities uh, trips and, you know, things that take students off campus as a part of them fulfilling their student learning outcomes. And, you know, we'll have to navigate, well, what does that look like from a virtual environment? Um, not just service learning, but experiential learning. Um, how, you know, what are those components and strategies that we can utilize to ensure that we're still able to meet those learning outcomes, um, uh, you know, as a department, as I'm sure with many other institutions, we have obligations from an assessment perspective uh, to be able to uh, demonstrate that, you know, uh, to some degree we're, we're attempting to, to meet those learning outcomes. Um, so that, yeah, that, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done in the next few weeks. Um, and de depending on what the plan is, if it's an early start or a hybrid, you know, a semester that, that really just doesn't offer a lot of time to put together a, a well laid out, well thought out uh, plan. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Thanks for sharing Chester. And, and yes, it's going to be a very fast paced next few months. Um, you see me coming back online so you know that our time together is drawing to a close. Um, before we wrap up a few items I just wanted to bring up again, we have a couple other virtual roundtables this week, small colleges and universities on Thursday and navigating move out on Friday. Um, of course, I'm thank so thankful for our moderators and our panels for joining us today. And as we wrap up our time, as we recognize that people have appointments at the top of the hour, if we could just go around, uh, just share a few parting thoughts with the group, just kind of rapid fire, something to give back to our attendees today, whether it's a morsel of knowledge, an approach you took on your campus, a bright shining light in life, whatever that is, your parting thoughts, and then we'll wrap up. So um, hello, everybody. Uh, again, I, I just want to thank you for being here. Um, my parting thought is this. Uh, remember that there are theories out there that you can 
go to and learn about. Um, there, there, just like there are uh, student development theories, there are theories for distance education. Um, one that for me is easy, easily approachable is called Moore's Transactional Distance Theory. It has three tenets and they're really easy to review and understand. And it puts you in the mindset of how to help students and support them online. So um, just remember it's out there for you. Um, just for me, uh, parting thoughts, um, you know, if, if this webinar isn't any indication, is, is really just an acknowledgement that we are all in the same boat, uh, looking to find the best path forward. Um, you know, while we are um, very passionate about our students, I think it's really difficult for any of us who are, um, and take myself for example, like to be in control of what is going to happen around the corner. I am uh, a processor and an analyst. I like to have all of the information and to be in this place where uh, things are constantly changing is extremely difficult. Um, it, you know, the, the important thing is to have as much patient, patience as you can and recognize that there are things that you just will not be able to control. Um, and this is not the time to be perfect, but it is, uh, you know, an important time for us all to kind of step back and reevaluate purpose um, and, and who do we serve ultimately. Um, and, and to do that by being as inclusive uh, as possible with everyone in your department, uh, your university, um, and also your peers across the profession. Um, tap into opportunities and resources like, you know, that what's provided through AKUHAI and some of the uh, other organizations uh, to find out what are the conversations, what are the topics, um, and, you know, bring that back to your home institution and uh, incorporate that into your planning and uh, into your discussions. And also, please, please, please take time for yourself. I think I echo both um, of what both Carl and Chester said. I think it's um, taking this time as an opportunity to rethink how we have always done what we do um, and thinking critically about that. But then also it's a time to, especially as resources are, are getting tight, are very, very tight for many institutions right now. And so um, how are you looking inward and what the resources are um, at your own institution, whether that's um, folks who do distance education, whether that's folks that maybe you haven't partnered with in the past, like how are you looking inward to get some of those pieces that we might have thought out um, externally in the past. Great. Uh, thank you again, panelists. Esme and Jeff, thank you for helping to put this together for the field. Uh, we are recording this. We will send out a message to all of our attendees with our recording and then some follow-up documents uh, from resources shared today. I uh, hope to see you again soon on another one of our virtual roundtables. Have a great day, everyone.